Why should Prospies be scared to come to Notre Dame? What is Idea Week? And have leggings ever obtruded painfully on your landscape? All this and more, One Dome starts now. Hello, Notre Dame. And this past week has been a big one in Notre Dame athletics. Two incidents of violence. Ooh, that's a tough question. My galactic mushroom overlords. We feel that it is our obligation to spill the tea. I think he uses uh, gold leaf. We are still convinced that Father Jenkins is a cowboy. To kick off the show, the newly renamed NDPD sent out two emails to the Notre Dame community recently. Reportedly, two incidents of violence occurred on Sunday, March 31st, both within two miles from campus. The first incident was an off-campus shooting in the 100 block of Notre Dame Avenue, and the second was a violent robbery occurring two blocks south of the Notre Dame campus. Anyone with information on these incidents is asked to contact the South Bend Police Department and members of the Notre Dame community are asked to stay safe when out and about and when hosting events for guests. Also in recent news, Notre Dame admitted 15.4% of over 22,000 applicants, extending offers for admission to 3,410 potential students. Over the past few weeks and in the weeks to come, Many of these students will live among us, trying to figure out if Notre Dame is really the school for them. So, here at One Dome, we feel that it is our obligation to spill the tea and let these prospies know exactly what they're getting themselves into. With this being Prospy season here at the university, what should Prospies fear most about Notre Dame? Ooh, that's a tough question. Mm. What do they fear most? Probably parietals. They can get you. I remember um, like the first week not knowing where anything was, but a month into school, you'll find your way around and it'll feel like home. So. Uh, nothing. The university is a very welcoming place. Speaking from experience, I would say the architecture students. They kind of dwell in their own cave and it's moved from Bond Hall to now Walsh, so you always got to be on the lookout for them. Um, I'd say probably getting adjusted with um, just the college lifestyle and probably a different lifestyle than you've had in the past. Um, and just um, making sure you can kind of find a routine that you like and get into that. I know a lot of them might have a hard time adjusting to this new environment. Have you hosted a Prosby yet? You know, I've never hosted a Prosby, but I've been a Prosby. Uh, how was that? It was a wild ride, but it was a good time. <laughs> we hosted one this weekend, actually, and I saw him once when he was leaving. Oh, wow. So they must be staying pretty busy. Apparently but so. The ball's in your court now, <laughs> Prospies. I'm joined on set now with One Dome reporter Jess Jordan, and she's been looking into the upcoming Idea Week and is here to tell you all about it. So let me just turn it over to her. So you've probably heard that next week is Idea Week here in Notre Dame. Although, if you're like most of the student population here, you might not know what Idea Week actually is. I can tell you I didn't until about yesterday when I started researching this for today's segment. Idea Week hosted by the IDEA Center here at Notre Dame. IDEA, all caps, stands for, give me a second, Innovation, De-Risking, and Enterprise Acceleration. Don't know what that means, but they've got about 60 events for us on campus next week. Last year was the first ever IDEA week and they had over 18,000 people in attendance, so they're hoping this year, with more events and even more innovation, they can break that record. On Tuesday, more events over at the Century Center, but the discussion's moving away from blockchain and into innovation and entrepreneurship. We have a corporate innovation panel, crawl, walk, and run with your data, IoT, or the Internet of Things, and your enterprise, or the IoT in action, reinventing and retraining the manufacturing workforce, and the Industry 4.0 Expo. Not really sure where the 4.0 comes from, considering this is only our second Idea Week, but I guess we'll find out. I do know they'll have food trucks and robots. Sounds like a great time. The Digital Transformation Panel, the Innovation and Manufacturing Panel, Funding Innovations and Manufacturing, not sure how those two are different, what AI can do and what it can't do, 
and the spirituality of manufacturing in true Notre Dame fashion. On Wednesday, we take things from the Century Center over to the Northern Indiana Event Center as the conversation on innovation continues. We've got some startup pitch workshops, the pitch basics for entrepreneurs, Smart Mobility Expo, not really sure what smart mobility is, but apparently there's a lot of hands-on interaction occurring. IoT, today and tomorrow, navigating the innovation universe, the age of automobility and driverless vehicles, the future of smart mobility with WNDU, and the end of auto insurance as we know it. Thank you, driverless cars, for that one. On Thursday, Idea Week comes in full force to Notre Dame with lots of events in Membrosa. On Thursday at 9 a.m., we have Kevin Kelly, Wired Magazine editor on The Inevitable. At 10.15, we have Creating Employee-Led Culture of Innovation. Also at 10.15, network like, network like a Champion Today. Unfortunately, that lecture is sold out, but it sounded very Notre Dame, so I wanted to mention it anyways. At 11.30, we have Plan B, that's spelled B-E-E, -E, as we talk about bees and pollination and how they're affecting crops across the U.S. Also at 11.30 is a sports tech panel. I know which of those two I'll be attending. At 1.30, the Startup Investors Panel, and at 2.45, building a $2 billion company with Kayak co-founder co Paul English. That session is filling up quick, so register soon. Finally, we have Why Now is the Best Time to Become an Entrepreneur with Courtney Kingston, who turned her family farm in Casablanca Valley into Kingston Family Vineyards. One last academic lecture on Friday, is with Kickstarter, and that's also full at 1040 in Mendoza. So if you didn't register, I'm sure if you walk by, you can catch a glimpse. Going on throughout the week are some other events a little less academic in nature. Start off your mornings with ideas at sunrise, coffee and contemplation. Each day will focus on a different topic of well-being, and they'll be starting at either 7.30 a.m. or 8 a.m., depending on how much they hate us and want us to wake up early that particular day. There's some award ceremonies throughout the week, Lots of prizes, cash prizes. That's about all I know about that. And John McNeil, COO of Lyft, will be in attendance for one of those events. Finally, we get to the fun stuff. Well, first, there's a healthcare panel, a di diversity awareness check your blind spots experience, and a talk on the future of spirituality and technology. Beyond that, though, we have Robot Football National Championship Tournament. If you've been missing your Fighting Irish football and want to see a second chance at the national championship, our Notre Dame robots will be competing against three other colleges for that national title in the Steppen Center, 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Saturday. There's also a Maker Fair, which I hear is very much like a middle school science fair, but for college kids. Finally, we've got some great performances going on. Tuesday night at 7.30 is the magician, Michael Carbonero. You may have seen a show, some pretty crazy stuff. Wednesday, 7 p.m. at the Lerner Theater, Scotty McCreary, tickets are still on sale. Thursday at 7 p.m., this one sold out, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill, Bill, Bill. Seats are first come, first served after you have your ticket. So your tickets aren't reserved to a particular seat. Get there early if you want to be in the front row. Following Bill Nye on Thursday, at 8 o'clock is comedian Ali Wong, if you need some lightheartedness after a little too much science. Finally, Saturday, the big one, Tim McGraw, sold out per cell pavilion, we are still convinced that Father Jenkins is a cowboy. One last event for Idea Week is the shirt unveiling, the most Notre Dame event going on next week. Eddy Street Commons, Friday at 4.30. Be there and see what we'll all be wearing at the first Notre Dame football game next fall. That's all for Idea Week, at least so far. They keep adding events, so we'll keep you posted. Thanks, Jess. That is a whole lot of stuff going on. A whole lot. I don't think anybody could go to all of them. Definitely not, considering half of them happen at the same time as other ones. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have leggings ever obtruded painfully on your landscape? Really can't say that they have, but apparently Marianne feels otherwise. Yes. I have a question for you from New York Times fashion director, Vanessa Friedman. When did leggings make the leap from garment to cultural lightning rod? That's right. We're talking about leggings now. Mary Ann White's letter from about a week ago set off a storm of controversy and put Our Lady's University in the national spotlight. Well, we don't know what Our Lady would have thought about her son living amongst legging-wearing women, I had to ask if anyone else at Notre Dame 
shared the view of Marianne White. In her letter to the editor of The Observer, she claimed that leggings obtruded painfully on her landscape. Have leggings ever obtruded painfully on your landscape? <laughs> they have not. They are very comfortable. I don't get why they offend other people. Um, I would not say that they have. Um, they've been, um, they have not been painful, I can say. No, I wear leggings freely. I don't really think about it. I just put them on. Um, to me, they're pretty equivalent to jeans. No, definitely not. Um, yeah, we went to a, there was a party and the theme was Roman toga and hot yoga and I was one of the only people to wear leggings during the party and it was a sweaty, uncomfortable night to say the least. Uh, I, I can't say they have. <laughs> I personally am a supporter. They are very comfortable, great for athletics. <laughs> I support wearing leggings. I think they're very practical, so I would not say that they have had any obtrusions in my life. <laughs> Message received. And now I'm joined with Austin Rooney on the set, who is our One Dome sports reporter. Hello, Austin. And he has our Notre Dame sports update. Well, thank you, Anthony. And this past week has been a big one in Notre Dame athletics. And let's start last Saturday when the women's basketball team took on the four-seeded Texas A&M Aggies. And the Aggies were led by their star, Kennedy Carter, who had 35 points. Second on the team in scoring was Kayla Wells, who had 18 of her own. But the Notre Dame stars came up big as well. It was Aguma Wale who led the way for the Irish with 34 points, while Jessica Shepard added 24 of her own. It was a close game all night long, but Notre Dame beat Texas A&M 87-80, to and that leads us into Monday night when Notre Dame took on the two-seed in the region, the Stanford Cardinal. Now, Notre Dame trailed after the first half, 33-26, did not shoot the ball all that well, but it was a really good second half for Notre Dame that led Notre Dame to a 16-point win. This time, it was Jackie Young who had 25 points for the Irish, while Enrique Agumbawale had 21 of her own. That led Notre Dame to an 84-68 win over Stanford. Up next for Notre Dame, it's tonight when Notre Dame takes on the UConn Huskies down in Tampa. Moving on to Notre Dame hockey last Friday night as they took on Clarkson University in the round of 16. Notre Dame trailed 2-1, but with 2 minutes and 20 seconds to go in the third period, it was Cal Burke streaking down the right side of the ice who found Bobby Nardella on a cross-ice pass, and Notre Dame tied the score at 2, sending it into overtime. Then Cam Morrison in overtime came up big again and won the game for the Irish 3-2. That sent the Irish into the quarterfinals with a matchup against UMass. Now, UMass outshot Notre Dame 34-13 and defeated the Irish 4-0. The Irish were really never close, despite the fact that the score was tied moving into the second period. UMass put up goal after goal, and the Irish had no answer. Nonetheless, the past three seasons have been really good for the Fighting Irish. They included a trip to the Frozen Four in 2017 and a matchup with Denver, a trip to the championship game last season, and this year a loss in the quarterfinals. So three straight years when Notre Dame has been one of the best eight teams in college hockey. Finally, the Notre Dame women's lacrosse team had the biggest win of their season last weekend against the fourth-ranked UNC Tar Heels. And it was goalie Samantha Jackalone who had an outstanding game and was named the National Player of the Week with a season-high 14 saves and at one point made eight consecutive stops. Samantha Lynch also had a really big game for the Irish, scoring three goals, leading Notre Dame to a 9-7 win over the fourth-ranked Tar Heels. Now, on Wednesday, Notre Dame traveled to Boston College. Get this, they're ranked number one in the country, but Notre Dame fell behind 6-1 early. They battled back, and with 8.47 to go in the second half, the Eagles' lead was cut to 2, 11-9. But the Irish comeback was stopped there as BC took down Notre Dame 13-9. So a pair of top-five matchups for Notre Dame. They split the series, one versus UNC, loss against Boston College. They've had a pretty darn good season this year. Thanks, Austin, for our Notre Dame sports update. And in the spirit of learning things that we should be learning in the classroom, we have a new segment here at Wound Dome called Pretty Neat. And for that, I turn it over to Joey O'Donnell. 
Welcome to Pretty Neat. I'm Joey O'Donnell, and this is a new segment where I talk about the funny, weird, and bizarre from the worlds of science and history. On today's adventure, we'll find Chinese relics, hominids, the end of the world, and a whole lot of drugs. This is the story of Terence Kent McKenna. Terence was born in 1946 in a small town in western Colorado. By the age of 10, he was a precocious child, showing a voracious interest in psychology and philosophy. He was known to make up words in his own language and to tickle his family members without mercy. In his teens, McKenna first discovered what would become his obsession, psychedelics. Around 19, he became especially fond of dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, and after his mother's passing, he and his brother Dennis traveled to the rainforest of southern Colombia to observe how indigenous cultures use the drug. However, his adventure quickly took on a new direction with his discovery of Psilocybe cubensis, magic mushrooms. And one notable experiment with psilocybin, Dennis convinced Terence to try to merge his neural DNA with the drug. Terence's experience was about as wild as his goal would suggest, and he devoted the rest of his life to experimentation with these mushrooms. He later became the first to cultivate the fungus on American soil, and he taught thousands of Americans how to do so themselves. McKenna was instrumental in bringing about the apocalypse craze of 2012. In the mid-1970s, when he was about 30 years old, McKenna discovered an old Chinese book of oracle reading and divination called the Book of Changes, and he began to develop a theory of time called novelty theory. The gist of his idea is that time itself undergoes regular reversals between a repetitive and dull habit and a radically creative novelty. Using the Chinese writings of the Book of Changes and more than a little psilocybin, McKenna theorized that the level of novelty is approaching infinite, at which point the laws of physics will break down and our minds will be liberated from our bodies. Using the release of the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima as a reference point, he calculated time wave zero, an incredible sounding function of novelty over time. The function predicted that novelty would become infinite in late 2012. When researchers discovered that Mayan calendars would end on December 21st of that year, McKenna and his followers became convinced of their theory. McKenna's contributions to human understanding didn't stop there. He also tackled the process of human evolution, arguing for what he called the stoned ape theory of human development. The growth of deserts in Africa, the theory goes, drove human populations away from tropical areas about 100,000 years ago. Forced into grasslands, our ancestors would come across wild cattle for the first time, whose droppings greatly facilitated Psilocybe cubensis growth. There, hominids ingested the mushrooms for the first time, and psychedelic effects prompted the formation of powerful communities, abstract language, and religion. Tribes with these elements would outcompete their fellow hominids and progenate the human race that we know today. Perhaps his craziest theory lies in the origin of magic mushrooms themselves. To McKenna, these mushrooms were an intelligent species in and of themselves. The spores of the fungus arrived on Earth after billions of years of space migration, where they have begin, begun working with us to facilitate our transcendence of our human limitations. If successful, they will turn us into a galaxy-roving species, comprehending the full profundity of the universe as never before. That's the story of Terence Kent McKenna. He died in 2000 from a tragic and largely incurable brain tumor. How should we look back on his 53 years of life? Was he a crazy hippie or the sage that his followers claim? I, for one, welcome my galactic mushroom overlords. Whatever the case, his story is pretty neat. And that's all we've got for you here today. For the whole crew at One Dome, I'm Anthony Rio. Farewell. What are you tweaking about? This question, to be honest, to be honest with you. Um, right now I'm trying to finish my thesis. I have a deadline today, so I would say tweaking out about that. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm a grad student, so just always. Wow. Actually, mm, It's not school related though, it's such a trivial, like I'm just applying for uh, traveling, so I just need to prepare some documents, that's the only thing I feel like mm, a little bit tweaking. Um, probably the couple exams I have between now and Easter break, um, and then just looking into um, finals week, um, just all the exams I have ahead of me. Tweaking.
I'm gonna say the warmer weather, the blue skies, and also woodworking lately. There's been a lot of YouTube on woodworking. It's gotta, you know, it's gotta be my Spanish test on Monday and bookstore basketball league. But I'm not tweaking about that, the other teams are. <laughs>